Thank you, Murat. It was supposed to be Christy Charlton to present this talk today. She uh, took a pregnancy test in December and found it positive, so <laughs> she kind of couldn't come. Actually, she could come, but uh, she found herself that the HCG protein was making big changes in her body and making her really sick in the morning, so the doctor didn't recommend, so it was a really bad thing. She, uh, we also presented a poster on her house today, so it was a big deal. So that's actually Christy right here on the picture. She's a graduate of uh, uh, Georgia Tech University in Atlanta. <coughs> and we both work at the uh, Dublin City University, actually in the institute called Biomedical Diagnostics Institute. And so we're kind of interested in nanoparticles in general. And the main reason why we do this is because the scope of the research of the institute is to design and develop a, a biomedical devices for uh, point of care applications. So some, some rapid. Uh, test or home test to use or even a uh, physician use. Um, so some uh, people in our institute they came up with the idea of using uh, high brightness or, or dye doped silicon nanoparticles for signal amplification so as opposed to using a single dye. So we can actually prepare these nanoparticles, we do it in-house, we can prepare these nanoparticles and dope them with, uh, with different dyes. And, uh, we can dose them with different dyes, obviously, as it depends on the uh, excitation uh, lasers and emission filters of the evaluation instrument. The, the story was that we were able to actually increase the uh, brightness of, of the label by several orders of magnitude, in the best case scenario, is about 40,000 times. This actually depends largely on the nature of the, of the dye, on the uh, quantum efficiency of the dye, on the stoke shift, which is the difference between the emission and excitation and also the overlap between the exhibition and emission. Uh, we prepare them by several techniques. One of the very common ones we like is microemulsion technique because it gives us a control over the shape, the nice big level of shape. Uh, with these techniques, we can probably prepare only like a smaller particle, something about between 20 to, to 200 nanometer. Uh, if you want to prepare the larger ones, you can choose a different technique. We also the, uh, entrap the uh, dye by physical, uh, physical absorption inside the silica pore, which leads to slowly some dye to leach out from the pores. So we prefer the covalent binding uh, that has some implication on the surface charges. So uh, I'll speak about it later. So this is the actual concept what we actually want to use it, uh, as the VDI. So again, we're <coughs> developing point of care devices, so it's kind of uh, biomedical uh, diagnostic devices. Usually it's uh, based of, on, uh, on an amino sandwich assay. So you have some captured antibodies on the surface. Then uh, you are capturing on it the uh, analyte, which is present either in the blood or, or serum, or it can be another uh, blood or fluid. And then you have a, <coughs> a labeled uh, antibody, which previously you were using just a single label as a single fluorophore. Uh, so now we're using actually a fluorophore, which looks like this, like by AD roughly 80 to 100 nanometer nanoparticles over with tens of thousands of these dyes. So yes, we really increase the, the, the signal. The, the challenge here, obviously, is that previously when you look at the labeling of proteins, you're labeling, you're putting one dye or more than one dye on the surface of the antibody here. In this case, actually, you're putting the antibody on the surface of the dye, which is like a dye. So the story changed a little bit. So we had to optimize the uh, conjugation the chemistry here because what you really want is you want the antibody to be uh, uh, linked to the surface of the nanoparticle uh, and, and remain active. I mean, if it doesn't remain active, it would not give you any response. So you would have zero sensitivity. So we kind of worked it out in some way. We're using some particular molecules called dendrimers, which are globally shaped, uh, nice, uh, one of these first polymers. Uh, they are sold now in, a, in a different generations, which means that they have different size, a different number of groups. Uh, this whole technique we actually found a pattern on it recently. And by changing this generation of dendrimer, we can actually uh, change the surface area or surface coverage of the, of the antibody on the surface. And this actually has a severe implication in, in assay. So we compared the effect of this multivalent linker, because it has a multivalency, because it's more than one functional groups, with some homofunctional or heterofunctional linkers, which are normally commonly used to conjugate proteins with nanoparticles, and we found out that the assay results was improved by about 35 times. So we said that actually this is very good, but 
uh, the obvious challenge and the objective of the whole group is now that we need some sort of validation technique, some assessment tool, something easy and quick which will tell us and characterize the diet of monoparticles, not just the ones which are already coated with the antibody, but also the ones which are which we make. So obviously we're looking at uh, 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 polydispersity. So once we make the particles, we need to know whether these are polydispersed or monodispersed particles. Because obviously, if you start with polydispersed particles and you start the conjugation reaction with the polydispersed particle, you cannot expect that you will end up with monodispersed sample. And the more polydispersed sample you have, the more polydispersed results you have. So that's something uh, which would affect the assay accuracy. Uh, obviously, we're looking at the surface charge too, and that's that's something we need to know. As I said, we put different dyes. These dyes, some of them are charged, some of them are hydrophobic, uh, non-charged, and they actually pack differently in the silica matrix. So we obviously would like to know some of the dyes go deep inside the silica pores. Some of the other dyes, they tend to stay in a in a closed silica, silica shell. Some of them even stay on the surface, which obviously changes the surface charge of the particle. And the last thing we really need to know is once you conjugate these particles to antibodies or even it can be DNA, you need to kind of make sure that this DNA or this antibody is active. So that's another way that you can tell and it needs to be in a quick way, something that a graduate student can do and in 10 minutes you can tell you, all right, so we made this nanoparticles, we made this conjugation technique and now I can tell you this is active nanoparticle, you can use it in an acid. which stops wasting your time. Obviously, we were using DLS previously for that, and recently we acquired the QNano uh, from ISON, uh, actually the PI of our, our group. I believe he's an advisory board of ISON. Is that true, Hans? Also, it was kind of mediated through him, which was very good because he knew a lot about it. So this is a, just one example of when we use dyla uh, the dynamic light scattering and what did we actually do with this. Um, so the, the way how you can look at the activity of the particle is when you can try induce aggregation of the particle when you add antigen in the solution. So that's what we had. This is the nanoparticles, particles, and here we have single chain fragment anti-CRP antibody linked to the surface of the nanoparticle. So when you have that uh, by DLS, you would get a signal that all right, this is one of these first relatively one of these first uh, solution. When you add, when you keep titrating and adding little by little of this pentameric CRP, what you expect is that this pentameric CRP will start cross-link these nanoparticles and induce aggregation, which you should observe by DLS, which we do observe, and that's why the uh, overall particle size is shifting with time. The trick with the DLS is that uh, it uses kind of larger volumes, and larger means that's a milliliter volume, and obviously you have to use a larger volume of proteins, which are very expensive. So we were really looking and we're happy that we get this QNano because the volume of the chamber is only like a, about 60 microliters or so. So that's, that's the next part. So we acquired QNano, when was it? I think it was uh, September last year when we bought it actually. So we're playing with it for uh, some time. So we use it mainly for validation, characterization of the particles, but now I also I will show you those at the, the end of this uh, presentation how about the aggregation and more. So, so these are some results when we just probe the particle size, which you can do very easily with this instrument. It's very actually easy to operate. Uh, we were able to actually probe some uh, particles which are kind of a lower nanometer scale, which I believe it was something uh, unusual for uh, these pores. You can see these numbers are actually uh, derived from a TEM images, and by by QNano you can, can tell that the average number is about somewhere around 65 which actually accounts for a uh, hydration sphere, which is around the nanoparticle, maybe even some uh, low density silica matrix uh, on the shell. Uh, you can also easily tell, and we can also easily tell, that some samples are highly monodispersed, while some other samples are actually uh, uh, more polydispersed. We, of course, validated it against some commercially uh, available particles, which are uh, polystyrene particles, also still talking about didote particles, so we have several types of those. Uh, the second thing that we were looking at, and we just not getting uh, information about the particle size, but also particle charge, why this would be important for us is that if you can actually tell see some particular uh, dye that is going to uh, change somehow on the surface, that the charge changes and the isometric point of the particle changes as well, on the, as opposed to a, a dye which is this ruthenium uh, 3 pp dye, the isometric point remains very low. 
which is really very important information for a surface scientist because then you can really design the conjugation protocols for a very efficient conjugation. You can take advantage of electrostatic interactions between proteins and, and the surface of the nanoparticles. Without the information, you will be just shooting black. Uh, so we were able to actually probe some differences between differently, different dyed open nanoparticles. I mean, they are supple, but you can actually tell. So th this was very good. Uh, we had some uh, uh, polystyrene particles, uh, and we were looking at them, and we were expecting that the uh, the company was saying that this is the amino functionalized polystyrene particle, this is the red line is the carboxyl uh, polystyrene particles, and uh, we were applying negative voltage, so we would expect that the carboxy as a negatively charged particle would actually uh, uh, be more <coughs> more negatively charged than the amino, which obviously would be a well, possibly positively charged, but it didn't happen. Actually, the amino particles.